Well, hello everybody. I am Liz Farrington. I'm the marketing manager at Spencer City. Many thanks for joining us this morning for our next webinar in the Arrow Comes Home webinar series. Today's session will focus on the electrification of transport and we'll be joined by a number of guest speakers who will be covering various different aspects of this topic. Um, each of the guest speakers are tech vendors and electronics experts and they'll each give a presentation followed by the opportunity to ask questions following their presentations. If I could ask please if everyone has their microphones muted but do use the chat function within the call here today and um, to ask your questions as you're going along and after each presentation the speakers will address the questions raised. Um, the first presentation um, will be a topic and market overview given by Martin Brown from Arrow Electronics and he will be followed by Michael Ireland and Steve Diaper from Silicon Labs who will talk about focus applications and use cases for the electrification of transport. Then we will have a recorded presentation uh, which is delivered by Eric Benedict and Paul Mayer from Analog Devices um, and even though the presentation um, that's been submitted is recorded uh, one of their colleagues will be on hand to answer questions um, from Mike Mayers. So we're joined by a whole host of experts today who will be covering the topic. Um, first of all I would like to hand over to Martin. Thank you. Good morning everybody, thank you for joining us. If I could just share my screen now. Can everybody see that? Yes, thank you. Good. I want to take uh, probably just a few minutes to discuss the, the challenge we have. Um, it's widely predicted that our energy demand is going to increase dramatically in the future. The International Energy Association predicts a 60% increase over the next 20 years. And that's because everything around us is using more electronics. We've got more phones, we've got more tablets, smart devices. Everything is becoming more intelligent and using more electronics. We're getting AI incorporated into lots of things. And the Internet of Things means electronics is being incorporated into all sorts of things that weren't previously intelligent and may have used very little electronics previously. And whilst all this is happening, climate change has become a major concern, along with our dependency on oil, and on top of that, the emissions are damaging the planet. So the growing need to stop using the natural resources, such as oil and coal, and drastically reduce the dangerous gases that we produce. We need to become much more focused on using clean energy and making everything as efficient as possible. The way forwards really isn't just to produce more electricity, um, but really to waste much less of it. And it's not just down to the consumer to use less, it's down to the whole chain is from how the energy is produced in the first place, whether it's renewable, solar, wind, how it's stored, and how we cope with the peaks and troughs in demand. And we need to develop smart solutions for generating the electricity, ideally with zero emissions. And we need to look right through to having a lot more efficient applications and appliances at the end of it all. Personal mobility, i.e. transport, is a huge contributor to the CO2 emissions, and this has become a big political focus across the world. Obviously, transport refers to any method by which people can, people or goods can travel, whether it be by air, sea or land. And all forms of transport are being targeted, including planes, trains and ships. However, cars in particular are being targeted and that's because there's so many of them. Um, some might, might say it's an easy target as well, but uh, by focusing in that area, in theory, there's the possibility to make big reductions in emissions. So the policy holders and the car industry are exploring different options for reducing emissions. And one method, which is extremely effective, is to electrify the drivetrain. The result of this 
is that the end product becomes much more efficient and it can have zero emissions. And in addition, another advantage, the audible noise is much reduced. So to summarise the term electrification of transport, it really means using an electrical source of energy to replace some or all of the reliance upon fossil fuels. As mentioned, cars are very much in the focus, but all other forms of transport are being electrified, including buses, trucks, boats, and we're starting to see projects with aircraft as well. Limiting factor at the moment with regards to electric aircraft is the power density of the battery technology. You just can't get the desired range that you need from a plane because the batteries are too heavy. And hopefully in the future, as the battery chemistry and technology improves, we'll see a change in that area. So what are the driving factors? With regards to the drivetrain, the major factor is legislation, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But it's not just about replacing an old internal combustion engine, or ICE as it's known. Uh, plenty of work's going on at the moment to actually improve combustion engines, make them a lot cleaner, more efficient. And there's a lot that can be done, and various steps that, be, that can be taken before you move to a fully battery electric vehicle. There's also a desire to make the cars far more intelligent, incorporating advanced driver assist systems, help with crash avoidance, for example, and ultimately making the driving completely autonomous. We've seen a lot of activity in that area. And then thirdly, there's the comfort aspects which is designed to make the journey more pleasant, whether it's safety features or infotainment systems. Most of these start off in high-end premium vehicles and then after a period of time work their way down to the cheaper models. If we just take a look at the, uh, the legislation aspect, this graph shows the CO2 emissions for various countries or the emission limits rather for various countries. And most are adopting a similar type of trend. The EU figures are in red. And as you can see in 2021, um, there's going to be a limit of 95 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer. And that's being reduced to 81 grams in 2025. And then further right down to 59 grams of CO2 in 2030. And these targets mean it's virtually impossible um, to achieve the emission limits using an internal combustion engine. And that's really why all car manufacturers at the moment are bringing out various forms of hybrid technology. Ultimately, the, the lower the CO2 limits that are applied, the more electrification is going to be required. This slide shows the, uh, the various steps of electrification for vehicles, going from a, a micro hybrid all the way down to a fully battery electric vehicle. The initial step with the micro hybrid is just to add a, a battery starter generator. So basically a start stop feature can be added to the car, which means that at traffic lights and junctions and things, the engine cuts out so there are no emissions. So on an average journey, the total emissions is reduced. But uh, interestingly, the, the actual emissions from the engine aren't affected at all. It's uh, exactly the same as it would be without the start stop. Moving on to the mild hybrid, um, you add a, an electric motor which assists the engine. And then if you move to the full hybrid and the plug-in hybrids, there's a complete motor inverter system and electric motor, which means that the car can drive completely on the electric if you want it to. And then moving to a full battery electric vehicle, the internal combustion engine is done away with completely. So it's only the full BEV that would have uh, zero emissions 
all the others still have a certain degree of emissions. Looking at the differences between the, the ICE and the EV versions, uh, this shows you um, how the costs compare per kilometre. So you're looking at seven cent per kilometre for an internal combustion engine, uh, going all the way down to two and a half cents per kilometre for a battery electric vehicle. And also shows the exhaust emissions. Uh, interestingly, the the figure of 60 grams per kilometre for the plug-in hybrid, you would only achieve that figure of 60 grams per kilometre on average if you actually charged it up via, you know, an electricity charger. If you just drove around in it all day, you certainly wouldn't get the 60 grams per kilometre. The figures here for the range and the refuel time are probably debatable. Um, it varies a lot from models to models and obviously depends upon the, the charger technology that's being used. The electrification doesn't just stop at the drivetrain. There's a growing trend now, uh, certainly for all the pumps on the vehicle, things like the oil pump, the engine cooling fan, water pump, all now to be electric. Uh, and historically, they, they were going to be DC brushed motors, but we see more and more of them now uh, being three phase brushless DC motors, which again is a more complex electronic solution. So you see more and more electronics getting put in. Then there's all the driver assist systems, the adaptive cruise control, lane departure monitoring, self parking, rear cameras, uh, lots more electronics. I so said before, the comfort and luxury features, the mood lighting, the infotainment systems. I've even seen cars now that project logos onto the pavement when the doors open. Um, personally, I'm not sure that's entirely necessary. All this means the average car is becoming a highly complex electronic system. In the next few slides, I've got some examples of some of the electrification projects that we've seen out in the market at the moment. If you could just excuse me, please, for one moment. I apologise for this. Apologise for that. Delivery people always turn up when you don't want them. As I was saying, this is a uh, a project from a company called Magtech. It's a electrifying a refuse collection vehicle, and I hadn't appreciated that your your average diesel vehicle would only do about two and a half miles for the gallon, due to all the starting and stopping and everything. And certainly within central London, the, the charges now for taking a, a dirty diesel engine into the centre of London, it can be up to £100 a day. So there's a huge advantage in taking out all of the diesel engine and replacing it with batteries and an electric motor. And I believe they've also replaced all the um, pneumatic system for operating the the crusher and things at the back with the electric motors and with this vehicle we're able to have zero emissions have a 14 hour shift capability and greatly reduce noise pollutions as well this is another magtech project actually it's uh, a class 165 locomotive which historically has been diesel and they've added a, a battery and quite high power electric motor to it. In fact, two motors, I believe. And the idea of this train is that when it's in built up areas in towns and things, it can run on electric. And when it's traveling between towns, it will run on diesel. So this obviously gives it a range extension as well, having the battery capability. And another big advantage is it 
it uses regenerative braking. So that, that greatly reduces the, the wear and tear on the mechanical brakes, so they can reduce the maintenance periods. This solution is from a, a Russian company called Arrival that's headquartered in London, and they have numerous electrification projects on the go at the moment. But this one's been in the press quite a lot lately. And it's a completely electric delivery van. And I believe, um, I think it's UPS may have placed an order for some. But uh, it's, it's basically a, what they call a skateboard platform where all of the batteries and motors and everything are built into a, quite a flat chassis arrangement, which uh, allows various top halves of the vehicle to be swapped over. So it's a very flexible, modular solution. And the, the performance of this vehicle is well, it's outperforming the, the legacy diesel vans. And the, the company arrival are hoping to sell it for the same price as the, the old diesel vans. And then finally, there's a nice picture of a, a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. As I said before, it's not practical at the moment to make an electric commercial aircraft. Um, at Arrow, we have we are involved with several projects looking at some smaller hybrid planes, whereby an electric motor and engine combined are used for takeoff, and then you can use a smaller jet engine whilst it's actually cruising in flight. But the reason I put this picture up, uh, the Dreamliner is the uh, Air, aircraft with the most amount of power on board. It's got four 250 kilowatt generators, which provides a fairly staggering one megawatt of power. And only some of that is actually used to keep the aircraft in the sky. A lot of the power then is used for the comfort of the passengers, um, the air conditioning, the heating, all the infotainment systems, the lighting. But it just shows how much electrification is happening in transport. Uh, that's basically the end of my, my short introduction. I hope you found it interesting. Um, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll attempt to answer them. It doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat, um, but if people do think of questions as we go along, um, you know, please, please do put them forward. Um, so thank you very much, Martin. I think that was a really helpful overview um, of, you know, the reasons why electrification is becoming more and more prevalent in the industry today. Um, I think now we're going to hand over to Michael and Steve from Silicon Labs, who can talk us through some of the more in-depth um, technology and components that sort of sit behind the um, smart output. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I'll just uh, start my screen. So hopefully you guys can let me know when you see this. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks. Brilliant. So uh, my name's uh, Steve Diaper, so I'm going to start you off with the, the presentation. Uh, I'm the sales account manager for Silicon Labs in the UK, and I'm joined together with my colleague Mike Island as well, who's a senior FAE um, within the UK office. So um, just a, a brief sort of uh, agenda. So we're just going to go through some market overview, some focus applications, uh, things that we see that are you know key challenges for the market uh, sort of today. Um, who's playing in that market, where we're uh, wonderful and great because you, you've got to believe that. Uh, and then sort of uh, if you want any more information then how you can get started. So just a bit uh, briefly about Silicon Labs, uh, just in case you, you don't know, we're uh, headquartered in Austin. Uh, we have around 1,500 employees worldwide now. Uh, we've grown massively uh, via acquisition. Um, and um, we're, you know, sort of traditional markets uh, that we've gone into uh, being automotive, MCUs, 
digital isolation and for the last kind of eight years we've been focusing on wireless technologies as well as that's becoming more prevalent in every application around the world that we deal in. So as I said, we've diversified quite a bit um, with the uh, the revenues now as the, the markets progress. So automotive, traditional sort of radio, TV tuners from that, that side of things, timing isolation with the uh, infrastructure needed for our high speed internets. Uh, the lovely Internet of Things that uh, we've got all those lovely smart gadgets uh, around our house now. So uh, we've got quite a lot of experience now building this up. Um, we're a fabulous semiconductor. We use pretty much the same people as uh, what everybody else does. So we come with all of the uh, industry standards, ISO 9000 um, with the ISO uh, with the uh, TS16949. So just a bit about the market overview. I mean, as you uh, you were just sort of uh, introduced to by Martin, um, there's loads of facts and figures kind of going out there. Here's a load that I did. It's probably about a year year out. Uh, Martin's probably looks a little bit more more sort of up to date. But the I think the main things are still there. The the market itself is still very much in its infancy. There, uh, but the one thing that uh, is still very um, prevalent is the the fact that there is a big driver to move to electrification. There is a, a big business opportunity uh, as well for companies like Silicon Labs and uh, companies trying to get into that, like power drive uh, drive people. So the um, the main thing really here is that it's still in its infancy. So. Things are still changing. We're still looking at the best ways to implement things. There's a lot of uh, researching going on with things like vehicle to grid um, with local governments. Uh, but the one thing is, as a worldwide market, this is absolutely huge and it's in its infancy. So there's there's plenty of movement to be had around here with technology, with innovation. So for the focus applications for us, um, we, we've kind of split it down into to three at this point. So charging, powertrain uh, and battery management. Um, so um, with the charging side, again, that's kind of split into three. So you've got a, a residential, you've got to work and you've got a public charging infrastructure. So they are the needs for those are slightly different. The, the residential side is starting to become smarter. So uh, whereas before uh, it was very much a, a switch on, on your wall and you came home, you plugged it in and it charged and there was no nece not necessarily any intelligence. Now the, uh, the UK government is actually driving change with that and adding a smart section, uh, cyber security. Uh, and so legislation, as Martin um, said in his previous uh, presentation said, that legislation is a big driver. So with that um, work with delivery vans, as you showed the arrival one, you know, you're going to have a fleet of uh, 20 vans coming in, going out at all different times. That can be a big draw on the on the grid. So there's going to be a need for load balancing. So again, the networking of chargers uh, is becoming more and more intelligent. And then you've got the public infrastructure side. So the public charging um, it's very diverse at the moment. You have to have multiple apps to kind of uh, plug in charge. I know I've, I've got a hybrid myself, so um, there's some challenges there and how to make that a little bit more seamless moving forward. And then the powertrain side, um, again, it's, a, it's another market that we see um, evolving quite rapidly. The, the technology that's going into these powertrains to drive a lot more efficiency out of the battery. As we know, the, the range uh, is the limiting factor with uh, EVs. So to get the most out of the, the powertrains, there, there's a lot of innovative technology going on in the way that they're driving that efficiency. Uh, and then moving on to the battery management as well, as long with the range anxiety, the, uh, the charging time is also a hurdle uh, for the EV market. So, you know, a traditional ICE, uh, you're in a petrol station, 
you're in and out within five minutes, whereas uh, with an EV, it takes a lot longer. So they're looking at like fast charging. So you'll have multiple sort of challenges around around that. So what's the uh, what's the kind of care about that we find? Um, so we're talking to a lot of customers where um, they're already using our devices. Obviously, one of the things that we like to do is, is get very intimate with our customer base, find out exactly what their challenges are, and hopefully some of our silicon actually uh, deals with that. Or if not, if it's, a, if it's a big market like this is, then we'll look at um, using our innovation to actually produce devices that are going to be used that are overcome these. So the ease of integration, um, so a lot of this technology now um, is sort of standards based. So pre-certified modules uh, with RF design, um, and then you have the ubiquitous connectivity. So um, if the smart charger has a Wi-Fi point or a BLE point so that you can connect to it, start your charging, schedule your charging, etc. Um, as with everything that is end to end connected, um, security is uh, an absolute foremost in most of the designs that we come across now. Uh, and so, you know, there is a lot, lot of sort of angles of that you need to think about from an end to end solution. So from our point, we're taking that very, very seriously and all of the latest chips that we actually produce has enhanced security. Uh, sort of functions within it. Uh, so that should uh, continue and meet the challenges uh, moving forward. And then the isolation side as well. You know, a lot of these um, designs, you're not going to be replacing on the wall uh, every five minutes like your smart light bulb. So, you know, longevity is a real, real big key here. So we've got some real good power electronics going through these devices. Uh, and so our devices have a long, lead to, uh, long lifetime. Emissions as well. Again, this is uh, one of the things as standards come along. Uh, emissions is a, a real big key thing. Ease of design. You want to basically be able to put these things in uh, and just get up and running. And then all of, of course, all of the uh, automotive uh, qualifications that sort of come with that and the high temperature requirements. So the other side too as well, from an application point of view, as we said, charge time. So you're going to have multiple levels of charging, which means different voltages. Uh, you've got the range anxiety as well. So improving the efficiency of gate drivers through innovation. Uh, and of course, the, the longevity side as well, that the, the aim is to get the million mile battery. So all of these kind of things add together with uh, quite a few challenges. Um, hence why I say it's still in its infancy. A lot of these challenges are being looked at how and worked out how we actually get around it. Um, so what I'll do now is I will hand over to my colleague, Mike Island, and then he'll take you through some a bit more technical uh, side to this. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm Mike Island. I'm a, an FE with Silicon Labs. And Steve's passed me the baton to handle a bunch of technical slides for this presentation. So let's start with this one. This is a, a I suppose it's fairly simple cut through of uh, what might be inside such a, a skateboard chassis, as Martin explained earlier. Um, there's lots of electronics. Not only that, there's lots of what we call voltage domains. So you've got big batteries that run at 600 volts. You've got um, inverters that charge the batteries. You've got DC DC converters that convert one voltage domain to another one. You've got engine management systems. All these things run off different uh, different power domains, and they all need protection from each other. Um, so what we've shown here, if it is clear, are some pretty thick yellow lines, which kind of infer that between different sort of electronic boxes, you've got different uh, different voltage domains. Um, I'll probably explain more about those later. So next slide, please, Steve. Next slide, that's it, that's good, okay. Um, so one of the things uh, we're gonna talk about is is the care about of electric vehicles. So range is, is one of the key things. Um, you want your battery to last as long so, as possible, so it can be at least competitive to the, the ICE car you used to have. Um, and when Tesla first brought out their, their various models, um, the battery tech and the inverter tech wasn't as good as it is now they had to do everything they could to reduce the weight on their cars. For example, you've seen the door handles, well, there aren't any. 
um, and they've done lots of things inside to get that weight down. Um, one of the key things that can also help is electronics. Um, and a key example here is the, the entire weight of the system. Um, the batteries, they weigh what they weigh, depending upon the range and the, the kilowatt hours of storage. But uh, the power electronics can be significantly lightened if you can run it at the higher speeds. Um, you basically, um, the higher the switching frequency of the inverter, the, the smaller, the physically lighter, the magnetics need to be, the, the transformers, etc. Um, so in this in this colourful box here, you've got the different sorts of um, FET technology that's in the world today. Um, the blue MOSFET boxes, everyone's done MOSFETs at college, of course, but they're, they can, they've got a fairly low voltage with stand, which means that when they're in the off state, they can only handle a few hundred volts before perhaps things start to go pop. Um, you've got the, the green box, the IGBTs that uh, can handle a lot more voltage, they're a bit more efficient, but you can't switch them as fast. Um, a couple of other things you've got SICK and GAN. Um, GAN you can switch very fast, but SICK you can also withstand a much higher blocking voltage. Um, if you remember your, your power equation, power is volts times current, then the higher the voltage you can you can operate at, the lower the current to get the same power. If you have a lower current, you have thinner wires, and the wires being thinner can save you weight. So there's various arguments about going to faster and faster switching devices um, in the electronics. So that's over the next slide, Steve. OK, so if we need to switch FETs, um, we need a way of doing this. Um, so unlike your standard uh, electronics degree um, biasing diagram, with a FET, it's not permanently biased when it's in a power mode application. It's switched off and it's switched on. Um, and the way to do it is to pull and push charge from the gate. Um, and the gate capacitance can actually be pretty big, so you need to dump and, and pull off quite a lot of charge to achieve the switching function. Um, and that's what gate drivers do. So we've got some diagrams here where our, our gate drivers are basically integrated circuits. Um, inside the block diagram, you've got uh, essentially a high and a low side um, driver device that can push or pull the, uh, the coulombs onto the FET gate. And then on the right hand side, you've got a very simple block diagram. You have a, a microcontroller that controls the switching speed and the duration of switching for the gate driver, which then uh, essentially turns off and on the, the high side, the Q1 FET, and the low side, the Q2 FET in that simple diagram. There's no load shown, but essentially they assume there is a load, whether it's an inverter, whether it's a heater or something else, or even some other DC-DC power supply. Uh, there'll be a, a load eventually there. Um, so that's what the, the gate drivers do. And they they chuck a few amps off and onto these these FET gates to uh, to switch them off and on quickly. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the question is, okay, you've got a you've got a gate driver. Why do you isolate the gate driver? Oh, there's three reasons, three main reasons. Um, the first one is you've got to have some safety. Um, so the power domain in which the MOSFETs operate. This diagram shows shows 400 volts, but typically in cars it's 600 volts or higher for a full EV. Um, and you need to isolate that high voltage from the, the lower side uh, clever electronics on the left hand side, the MCU, the battery, the engine management system, etc. Um, and it's not just the fact that it's a higher voltage, you've got different, different ground planes. So the, the ground symbol on the left isn't actually the same potential as the ground symbol on the right. Um, these voltage domains are all created by switching things through devices called transformers where there's no galvanic connection at all. There's no naught volt link between the two voltage sides. They're essentially current loops um, working uh, in different voltage domains. So what's shown as the MCU voltage, which might be 3.3 volts with a naught volt ground, essentially the, the positive side is an excess of, of charge and the negative side is a lack of charge. Um, so on the right hand side, although you may have a 400 volt system, um, it could easily be, you know, a very, very high positive voltage and a very, very low negative voltage. You connect those two so-called naught volt planes together, a lot of charge flows, things explode, people get hurt. So you need to isolate the control signals between them, and that's what isolators do. Um, another example would be the central uh, picture here. Um, <clears throat> ground currents. So with a, a motor inverter, you can be pretty sure that's going to be electrically a very noisy um, system. Um, and you may want to make the, the sensitive electronic side, the, the sensors, 
for example, the ADC is immune to that. So again, you, you cut that, that ground loop. Um, and more simplistically, on the final right hand side diagram, you just want to do a level shift. And an isolator is a very easy way to do that. OK, next slide, Steve. So how do our isolators work? Um, they're analogous to very, very old devices called optocouplers that use light to pass across um, a galvanic isolation barrier. But instead of light, we use an RF carrier. Um, the input side to our isolator will be a digital control stream, the input signal. Um, here you see a 50-50 mark space ratio set of ones and noughts. That turns on and turns off um, an RF oscillator inside our die, which is able to pass through the isolation barrier. And then on the secondary side of the die, it's recovered and you have the output signal again. But again, you have no, no DC current passing through the isolator. You have isolation. OK, next one, Steve. Wow, this slide's very busy. <clears throat> OK, it's essentially you've got four symbols of what our isolators look like. Um, top left uh, picture, um, that's the guts of the parts. You've got some, you've got two dies, uh, an input die which has the, the RF oscillator on it. Um, you've got some fabricated capacitor plates on the die itself, which actually create the isolation barrier. Um, on the secondary die, you've got, again, another set of, of cap plates, so you get a reinforced isolation and a receiver um, circuit there, so you get uh, the data passing through without any, any DC. And, you know, our isolators have multiple channels in them, so you can have more than one channel going through. You can have channels going from left to right and right to left. Um, the diagram below that uh, is a cut through. So again, you can see the two the two separate lead frames. Again, there's no connection whatsoever. Um, we do have bond wires between the two fabricated capacitors. Um, again, this is just to carry the the electrons from one side to the other. Uh, the process is fully differential. Um, you've got a, a decap picture. Again, you can see uh, we've got six sets of uh, bond wire pairs there for a six channel isolator. And finally, you have a, an X-ray of the lead frame, again, showing basically there's no conductive path. If you remember, DC doesn't get through capacitors, only AC. And that's why we use RF. OK, next one, Steve. Thank you. Um, so in terms of gate drivers, we've got a fairly large and growing range of gate drivers. Um, in particular, um, the 826X and the 823X are aimed at driving silicon carbide and gallium nitride devices. Um, we have IGBT drivers also that can drive those sorts of chips. They need functions called desaturation and Miller clamping to protect the uh, the high power device. Um, another key feature is some parameter called CMTI or common mode transient immunity. Um, imagine you've got a, a very high revving Tesla, if you can use the word rev. Um, <clears throat> you're essentially switching the, the inverter very, very quickly. You've got the entire battery voltage dropped across the uh, the drain source of the uh, the inverter FET and then going through to the the low the actual motor the weight of the car itself um, if you're switching that voltage very quickly on the secondary side isn't that going to kind of radiate and get back to the primary side and cause some horrible positive feedback effect it can um, and that's where we need common mode transient immunity to protect the electronics and that sort of feedback event um, so you do require parts have a very, very high CMTI spec to, to protect the entire system. OK, next one, Steve. Uh, so this shows another example of what I was just saying. The, the top left graphic shows essentially the ramp across the, the high side MOSFET. Um, and if you don't protect the electronics from that, that ramp leaking back from the right hand side to the, the controller side, you can imagine a positive feedback effect and the whole thing goes uh, dangerously unstable. So our latest devices have got very, very high common mode immunity uh, to avoid skipped or fed back pulses and also a very, very high latch up immunity to a 400 kV per microsecond to prevent a permanent damage uh, in that situation. This is essential in, in high speed, um, high power switching electronics. Next. Again, a nice bigger idea of our, our parts here. A couple of variations of the 827X. Um, you've got the, the driver control on the left hand side, the, the CMOS isolation barrier down the middle, and a high and a low side uh, driver device that sources and sinks uh, charge onto the FET gates. In fact, with these sorts of parts, you actually have three dies. You've got an input die for the, 
the uh, the MCU controlling features, then the high and the low side outputs, these are on separate dies as well, because of course, ground A and ground B aren't really the same, are they? Um, the bottom part is a single channel driver, but we have uh, two possible um, outputs here. It's actually wrongly labeled. So you may want a different current for the, the high side. You may want a different current for the charging compared to the discharging um, uh, rate of the, the gate. So you might want to have physically different resistors on the, the charge and discharge pins. So that's what we have there, the option to do that. OK, next. Um, so since we're presenting a sensor city, I thought I'd put some sensor slides in. Um, so once we've made the isolation barrier, we can pretty much do whatever we want to the electronics um, either side of that. Um, so in these cases, we've made um, differential sensors. Um, we have differential voltage sensors shown here where you drop perhaps a small resistor that uh, has a voltage buildup based on the current on the left hand side. You can feed that across the barrier and recover that. Um, again, so then you get a sense of maybe battery voltage or a sense of something else going right or wrong inside the uh, the motor of the vehicle. Um, there's two variants, one with a differential output, one with a single-ended output. Um, again, the nice part of these devices is the very, very high noise immunity we have, the 75 kV per microsecond spec. Um, another key parameter with any sort of isolation is the withstand voltage. So typically you've got um, a different voltage domain across the barrier. Maybe you've got a three volt, three volts domain on one side and a 600 volt domain on the other side. That's normal operating conditions when everything's working just right. Um, say somebody throws a spanner into the works, the motor jams or something else happens, you can get a very, very high, um, a high surge or a high over voltage situation created. Um, and the isolator needs to protect the electronic side from that event uh, for up to a minute um, before things start to fail. And in that minute, you've got time for other electronics in the vehicle to sense what's going on to shut things down to make things safe and so on. So this, this withstand voltage of 5 kV is a key parameter um, in the market. All right, next one, Steve. Thank you. Um, another last one, if you want to go straight into uh, an MC on this side, you can measure your voltage on the, the left-hand side. And you've got a sigma delta modulator for a direct data and clock feed um, onto the right. Now, all of these sensor chips have got a very, very good uh, industry leading um, accuracy in terms of input referred offsets, in terms of um, output voltage drift versus temperature, um, in terms of signal to noise ratio. You can measure down to very, very low signals, 90 dB SNR there. Very linear. So we've got a 97 dB total harmonic distortion spec. Um, and in terms of how many bits of accuracy, uh, 14 uh, effective bits of accuracy uh, we can achieve with these devices. Um, all in the standard stretched SO8 package. Um, and another spec for our devices, they're all um, coping with a very, very high temperature range up to 125 degrees C and down to minus 40. Um, the 125 is fairly easy to, to achieve. Um, essentially, the parts aren't drawing much current, so the junction temperatures don't get that high. But uh, hey, we do it. Next one, Steve. Thank you. Um, again, another slide of a voltage measurement system. So if you want to measure how many volts left on the battery, you basically pot down with some big resistors on the battery side, measure that, and put it across the barrier. Um, what I will say is that uh, the way to get a linear voltage across the barrier when you've got on-off keying, is to basically change the density of the pulses. So you have a pulse width modulator, a PWM stage here, and that's what does that. OK, next one, Steve. OK, is this more mine, Steve? I think it is. Um, why we win? Um, we're a leader in connectivity, so IRT, IoT has been a very, very key focus of Silicon Labs in the last uh, seven to eight years, very much focusing on, um, on wireless connectivity. Um, we pretty much lead the standard with sort of existing and new devices. We do compete with a lot of larger companies and we are fairly successful against them, winning quite a few sockets. Um, next one, Steve. Cool. OK. Um, now, if you want to sell an electronic circuit into an automotive manufacturer, um, they're pretty fussy 
Um, no one likes a, a big recall of cars in the market. So you do require lots of specifications, lots of paperwork to uh, to achieve this approval from the manufacturers. So you require essentially an automotive grade of production for the vehicles, which means that, OK, your clever IC guys have made the chip. Um, they've designed it, they've got the die and the reticule all worked out. Your production line needs to be automotive approved. You need to have a zero defect part per million guarantee. You need to support paperwork called PPAP, IMDS and CAMDS. And you need a lot of audit preparation as well. Um, so, yeah, very, very paperwork heavy. But we can support that. Next. OK, simple slide. So a lot of automotive electronics talk about AEC Q100. This is a test and qualification for active IC components. Um, the, the 200 spec is for the passive ones. Um, so all of our isolation parts have this ACQ100 qualification. Uh, the tests basically stress the part to make sure the design is rugged enough to withstand the mechanics of a vehicle moving along a bumpy road, etc. Here's a quick snapshot of the sort of tests that are done. So you've got uh, accelerated life testing, uh, temperature cycling and stress testing. You can see the certain lot sizes, various qualities or quality specs they refer to uh, and the number of parts in the batch. Um, and of course, we, we pass this. There's a lot more specs. But basically, every isolator we provide has uh, this ATQ100 spec attached to it. It's on the data sheet. Uh, next one, Steve. Thanks. And I think this may be my last slide. There may be some animation on this one, too. I'm not sure. But uh, to differentiate between industrial grade and automotive grade, um, there's a lot of things that have to happen in your production line. Um, yes, you require the ATQ100 qualification. Uh, the DPPM is also quite key. Uh, industrial grade parts, it's kind of OK to have a, a yield that's less than 50 defect parts per million. Uh, with your automotive grade parts, it's got to be zero. Um, if something goes wrong, every IC manufacturer has a recall or an investigation process into why the device failed. Um, when it's automotive, it's a priority. It's literally 24 hour turnaround. It's very, very fast, very intensive. Um, the process flows, the, the monitoring, the bin limits are all essential for automotive. Um, you need good and bad die cluster detection, dynamic PAT, lots of optical inspections, lots of certified equipment. Um, and in terms of the testing, uh, you have to test everything at room and hot and sample with cold. So testing takes a little bit longer. Um, and then you have the documentation stage two, which is, again, we provide documents upon request of customers with NDAs. And these are pretty hefty documents. And it's part of a paper trail of approval for customers to use the parts. Very important. I think that's my last slide. I'll pass it back to you, Steve. And there you go. There goes the animation. Great. Thank you. Cheers, Mike. So Mike's covered the isolation. So I'm just going to cover uh, pretty much from a high level the uh, the connectivity side to, to how we uh, we can interact with these things. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, Silicon Labs has grown uh, via acquisition and um, when it comes to wireless connectivity, uh, our sort of remit is very much of a standards based uh, approach, but we also realize that there's uh, been a lot of wireless technology that's been developed for proprietary applications. Um, so our um, basically our portfolio now covers pretty much all of the aspects um, when it comes to wireless connectivity. So uh, quite a number of years ago, we developed pretty much a common platform. So where we saw the need that actually a standards based approach um, is the way that's going to attack the challenges for most applications. We developed a common platform which we call the Gecko series. So e each Gecko pretty much is uh, can run all of the different standards that we supply today. Uh, and it has a, a sort of common layers to it. Rail being a, um, a rapid uh, layer that you can just get access to a reduced number of registers to be able to configure the um, the radio uh, and a common bootloader throughout all. So running the same or different stacks on the same platform. 
the uh, one of the things that uh, may be coming along as the residential charging is going to be part of the home um, and I'll say the smart home uh, with most of us using Google or Amazon Alexa um, we've got smart meters coming along as well so all of the high voltage kind of um, appliances that we will have you know we're going to have a need for kind of connectivity to load balance these kind of, kind of things uh, one of the latest sort of think tanks is the uh, amazon google and apple are working on what they call a connected home over ip application layer uh, which will sit and so there's a possibility as things are evolving that sort of residential chargers could make use of this and have that part of the connected smart home Multiple use cases as well. Um, you know, you do see uh, some residential chargers using Wi-Fi. You see them using Bluetooth, and you use and uh, see them using uh, GSM type of technologies. Uh, and further on, I'm sure there's uh, some wide other wide area network. So um, with a common platform, we can actually utilize uh, multiple protocols on one device. So if you're using the connected home over our, uh, home over IP or a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi, it can be handled on, uh, on the platform. Um, the only thing that I'm gonna really kind of point out are, on this is, uh, you know, is the security side as well. So we're now onto our generation two uh, platform. So with uh, some improved uh, performance sort of from the radio characterization um, and low current, the the main thing here is the dedicated security core so as the need for more and more um, security uh, we're putting that into hardware um, so you've got faster sort of reactions and boot ups and uh, crypto decryption de uh, secure debug and unlock so you know the code is pretty much um, hardware secure Um, so I think I'm going to hand over back to, to Michael now, and he's going to take you through to the end of it, which is just a few success stories. OK, thanks, Steve. Yes, I'll just unmute the mic. Um, yeah, so a, a couple of good things to, um, uh, if you like, put in our belt are we're not just, um, you know, an IST company remote from the world we actually do try to partner with people that make the the power fets um so we do have some some good designs on the reference platforms of actual power fat manufacturers like transform and gan and panasonic uh and then for the sick then there's a very well-known company called Creo wolf speed who who use our gate drivers on the ref designs um to be fair we're not the only people but uh, they do include us um and to sort of wave someone else's flag. This is very much a company that's growing, growing massively. Um, I was at an Arrow event uh, last November, and uh, these guys gave a presentation. And the uh, the sort of size of fabs they're building, I think, in the states, in New York State, to allow for the uh, the increase in the world's market use of of sick devices um, is absolutely huge. Um, so to be um, recognized by these manufacturers as a partner supplier of, of solutions is a no, no mean trick. Um, in terms of the actual design wins that we do we do have, um, these are obviously with isolation, there's many, many markets for them. Um, I will say a key one, and I'll, I'll hark back to Steve's early comment about um, longevity um, of operation, is that uh, if you're a solar inverter manufacturer and you supply electronics to these massive solar farms in the middle of nowhere then these things have to last for for decades um before having to have someone to go out and restrip out the electronics and replace them so um operation lifetime is a very key uh, requirement for the uh the solar inverter market and also you know electric cars are meant to last a long time too there's talk of the the million mile battery so once that's lasting that far the other electronics also needs to last a long time and because you have very very few moving parts the wear and tear is actually pretty minimal on electric vehicles um, so again our isolators have got this this 60 year plus lifetime design built in at the the fundamental level um, and in terms of the main automotive manufacturers obviously china and the eu you can obviously think of a few big names there they are 
very much doing lots of new designs all the time and we're very much in bed with those people. I think next slide, Steve. Thank you. Uh, one really early success story, uh, Tesla, um, when they first been, began to have these huge battery packs, they needed to monitor every every cell almost to make sure it was operating properly. Uh, groups of cells had to be monitored and if necessary, not used if they became faulty. Um, so our isolation technology, although it uses RF, it does use it in a differential way. So there are no emissions, uh, the two phases cancel. Um, essentially, without going into too much detail. Um, so Tesla actually came to us to use our parts instead of somebody else's parts they were using. Um, and so we got some very, very early design wins with them. And this was before we even had automotive grade parts. These parts, these were standard industrial grade parts, and they were still still good enough for them in the early days. So that's a simple Tesla board I found online. There's the T for Tesla. It's real, believe me. Um, we actually use a couple of our parts. There's a nice data part there, uh, an 86. I think this is 8642, small print, and an MCU down here too um, by Silicon Labs. Um, just one point, vehicle emissions, this is electronic emissions, this is RF radiation. This is key uh, in a car. Not only do you want to still be able to tune your radio, but you want to use your Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth, you want to get pick up from your tyre pressure monitors, that you also use RF systems, and you don't want to block any nearby vehicles in terms of you blocking their radios, etc. So having low emissions from the electronics is really pretty key. Um, we have emission testing results from independent test houses that show how very, very electrically quiet our parts are. OK, next slide, Steve. Um, another nice electronic slide. Big Japanese OEM, OBC means onboard charger. So you have the clever electronics in the car, not in the charging pile. Um, it's a Korean tier one. So tier ones basically do the design for the, the car manufacturers that more like to focus on the body shell, the engine block, etc. Uh, the tier ones do the clever electronic stuff. And these are the people the car manufacturers turn to as the first level of uh, design support for their products. Um, so we were able to essentially get there's quite a few parts in there. There's a couple of gate drivers and there's a couple of uh, uh, multi-channel isolators there for reading back across the barrier and also down here um, a voltage sensor so we're able to hit multiple sockets on these sorts of electronics with our solutions um, so they're, they're very good for us maybe that's moved on again Steve I'll let you do the next slide and we'll see yeah back to you Steve thank you thanks Mike um, so um, how do you get started? What what system, what parts in the system can we address? So hopefully by now you've realised that we do isolation, um, we do automotive MCUs and we also do connectivity side. So really throughout the electrification chain, uh, we should have uh, some sort of devices that can get you going. Um, uh, so regardless of what um, what you're looking at, we should have something in there in one of those blocks. Um, so really, it's just a, a case for you guys to, to reach out to us. Um, let us know what it is that you're trying to achieve. We can help you get the right um, kits, the right device uh, and look at the right technology. And I think that's uh, pretty much uh, our presentation. Um, just I suppose the, the future considerations. Obviously, the connectivity uh, is going to change. Uh, isolation standards will change uh, and as a company we are committed to moving with those standards so just like to say thank you on behalf of me and Mike brilliant thank you very much um, we have a couple of questions come in and um, the first one was from Julian asking how practical is solar recharging of electric vehicles um, I think this was following Martin's presentation. Um, Martin has had to leave this call, but he has emailed through um, a response to that question. If I just could read that out. So uh, the answer is, um, it depends basically how much power that you want. So if it's a single vehicle and charging slowly, then it is possible. Um, there's a link he sent, which I can forward on uh, to my energy website which do a home system for utilising solar power. Um, he's also said, generally, the market is split into AC charging 
relatively low powers to DC rapid chargers, anything up to 350 kilowatts and beyond. There are some projects that use dedicated recharging stations with panels on the roof and energy stored in a large battery banks to rapidly recharge vehicles. But whether these systems rely completely on solar or whether it complements an AC supply, he's not quite sure. But he has given me his contact details. So if you would like to find out more about that topic, um, I can circulate those when I share the slides following this webinar. And um, we did have another question uh, from Phil, who has asked, how do you think lockdown and the ongoing changes in working patterns will have impacted the electrification market? A very topical question. Um, he suggests himself potentially um, there might be an increased demand for delivery vehicles from online orders, um, or perhaps people will be happier with a longer charging times um, vehicles if they are spending more time at home or perhaps not commuting to the office as much. I don't know whether um, Michael, Steve, have any thoughts about that one? Um, <laughs> this is Steve. So I think really the, the, the first thing to note um, is I think it's a really good question. I, and I don't think we um, know the full effects, whether, you know, this is the new normal or whether, um, you know, things are going to go back to what we saw before. I think from a Silicon Labs perspective, you know, we're further down on the component um, side and design side. We haven't seen a drop off on um, on any of these type of projects. Um, so the demand is still sort of going. It has presented challenges in within labs were for testing and things like that. So there is a min minimal delay there. But as a whole, we haven't really seen this side slow down from a from a design perspective. Great. OK, well, that's one to watch, I guess. And um, so thank you very much. Um, if we could then move on to the final presentation from analog devices and um, that would be that would be great thank you okay so um we've got a, a pre-recorded uh presentation from analog devices about 23 minutes or so um it's it's basically just taking one of i mean the the electrification market is such a huge market so it's just looking at one particular area and this is the gate drivers so um let me just uh Right. Can you can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Good. I shall start it then. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody. Today, Eric and I will be talking about some of the key requirements to consider when using isolation and in particular gate drivers in e-mobility power conversion systems. While we will focus on automotive applications, it's worth noting that analog devices have technologies that are also used, used in the wider electrification ecosystem. For those interested, there is a wealth of material available on our website that shows how we enable safer, more efficient and lighter battery systems for both mobile and stationary energy storage applications, as well as faster charging and more efficient power conversion schemes within, to, and from both vehicle and the grid. Let's look closer at the vehicle now. In this abstraction of an electrical vehicle system, you can see some of the target applications automotive engineers focus on, such as traction inverters, battery management systems, DC-DC conversion systems, and onboard chargers. On this slide, we can see some of the analog IC solutions that are required in a typical EV. There are different position speed and current sensing modalities, both lead acid and lithium ion battery management, both of which exist in modern EVs. There are power management ICs and general signal conditioning ICs. And of course, there are a variety of isolation solutions. To service our customers, Analog devices invest in and have leadership positions in all these areas. As you can see, some of these analog IC solutions map to more than one end application. When mapping technologies to applications in a car, it is essential that all parts offered to customers meet stringent automotive quality requirements. Parts recommended for automotive should not only be put through AACQ100 qualification flows, but they should also follow separate automotive branding, 
production flows and processes, both in development and post-release. ADI followed these practices to continue to ensure we deliver the analog performance expected of us and do so reliably in the harsh environment of EV powertrains. This requirement for robustness is particularly relevant in isolation solutions, which, as you can see, are used in some of the most challenging and mission critical EV subsystems. Isolators are expected to be exposed to some of the highest working voltages and toughest transients, as well as experiencing electromagnetic temperature and other stresses. They play a critical role in protecting other ICs and people in automotive battery management, inverter and charging subsystems. Eric is going to talk in more depth about some of these applications and the characteristics of optimal isolation solutions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, first, I'm going to quickly review the signal chains for two key e-mobility subsystems, the onboard charger and the traction inverter. First, here is an example of an onboard charger, or OBC, which interfaces the AC grid with the vehicle's high voltage battery. In order to meet grid code requirements, the grid interface is typically some form of a power factor controlled rectifier to generate the primary side DC bus. The, primary, the power factor controller is then followed by a DC to DC converter to interface with the high voltage battery. Depending on the details of the particular topology, there is the potential need for isolated sensing and or gate drivers. Next is the traction inverter, which converts the DC from the high voltage battery into the proper variable voltage amplitude and frequency output required by the AC traction motor. Note that the switch nodes of the inverter are directly connected to the motor windings. Again, similar to the OBC, there is the need for isolated sensing and gate drivers. Because of this need for isolation in these and other applications, analog devices invented digital isolation technology and is the leader in digital isolation with over 18 years of proven performance in isolation for data, signal, power, and communications applications. Analog devices I-coupler digital isolators use transformer coils with polyimid insulation to achieve extremely high performing insulation with over 15,000 volt surge ratings. The differential S-coil topology minimizes EMI radiation in order to meet the stringent class B requirements. This also makes the isolators more immune from the external disturbances which naturally occur in power converters. The iCoupler digital isolator's high voltage galvanic isolation barrier of over 5,000 volts RMS makes them a perfect fit for gate driver applications. Wide band gap devices are growing in popularity. Why? The material properties of wide band gap semiconductors allow for higher voltage operation, high switching, and higher temperatures compared to traditional silicon devices. These properties allow for more efficient and power dense converters. How is this achieved? Through lower conduction losses and faster switch transitions. Lower conduction losses are obtained through the wide band gap devices, smaller channels, which are enabled by the greater critical electric field. The faster switch transitions mean shorter rise fall times, which reduces the switching energy, which in turn allows a higher maximum switching frequency for the same power dissipation. Increasing the switching frequency allows for a reduction in passive component values, which results in a smaller converter volume. This provides the converter designer options for producing a smaller and more efficient converter, which results in increased vehicle range. Analog devices offers a broad range of isolated gate drivers, which span from the basic drivers suitable for onboard charger or DC to DC converter applications, where cost and small driver size are crucial, to premium performance applications where full performance and online configurability are required to achieve the highest level of system performance. 
Let's review some of the fundamental features which are required for all gate drivers. Here we have a typical half bridge switch pole with MOSFETs Q1 and Q2 connected in series across a DC bus. I've shown two isolated gate drivers which provide the drive needed to turn on Q1 or Q2. From a gate drive perspective, the MOSFET appears as a capacitor between the gate and source. To turn the MOSFET on, this capacitor must be charged above the MOSFET's threshold voltage. The gate driver provides this charging current through its pull-up driver transistors RDS on. The capacitor CGS charges through the series combination of RDS on and RG1. This means for a stronger drive that will charge CGS faster, you need to choose a gate driver with a lower RDS on. Note that when selecting a gate driver, many data sheets list the peak short circuit current, which suggests that the driver can deliver more current than it is actually capable of when in a real application where there is a non-zero gate resistance. Analog devices data sheets list a current which is achievable with a realistic non-zero gate resistance. This means that the gate drivers from analog devices do not require an external buffer stage. Because the source of Q1 is connected to the switching node V phase, isolation is required to allow the control circuitry to remain at chassis ground. Depending on the application circuit, isolation may also be required for the low side switch, such as when the DC bus is midpoint grounded. The required level of voltage isolation depends on the system voltage, as well as the safety requirements. Functional isolation provides enough isolation margin to allow the circuit to function, but requires additional external isolation and or barriers to protect the users. Safety isolation adds enough isolation margin that users are protected as well. Propagation delay describes the timing impact the gate driver adds into the system control. Obviously, faster is better. But more important is to make sure that there is a symmetric delay for turn on and turn off so that the switching between the upper and lower switches can be more tightly controlled. In order to prevent having both switches on at the same time, resulting in a shoot through short circuit, a dead time is inserted into the switching commands to briefly hold both switches off. Asymmetric propagation delays will increase the required dead time and since minimizing dead time both improves the output waveform quality as well as increasing efficiency, it is important to have symmetric propagation delays. So the drive strength, isolation, and propagation delay all assure that we can make the switches turn on and off when we want. But we also need to assure that the gate drivers are able to reject disturbances so that they don't switch until we actually command them to switch. First is the Miller effect false turn on, which can occur during or following, excuse me, the turn off when the opposite switch starts to turn on following the dead time. Here, the drain gate capacitance CDG is important. When the drain source voltage of Q2 starts to rise as Q1 turns on, this charges Q2's CDG, which produces a current that flows through the gate resistor and the gate drivers pull down RDS on. This current will produce a small bump in VGS. If this voltage is below the MOSFET's threshold voltage, say VTH1, the MOSFET remains off and all is good. If, however, the threshold voltage is lower, say VTH2, then the MOSFET may briefly turn on, which is not desired. One way to deal with this is to use a negative VGS voltage when the MOSFET is off. In some applications, this works fine. However, in others, there may be additional impedance in the gate loop circuit, such as parasitic inductance due to the physical distance between the driver and the switch. This additional impedance may result in a VGS bump, which is too large to overcome with a negative VGS that remains within the MOSFET's gate oxide absolute maximum. In this case, adding a clamp transistor, 
which provides an alternate low impedance path for the Miller current is a good solution. Analog Devices offers options for gate drivers with internal Miller clamp transistors for a smaller board footprint in BOM or a driver for an external clamp transistor when the clamp needs to be located right at the switch. The switching action of the converter also generates currents which flow through the capacitance formed by the isolation barriers. This common mode current will flow right through the gate driver and cause the driver to misbehave. Because of the switching action of the converter, common mode transients are inherently generated and for wideband gap devices, these transients can be quite high. CMTI is a measure of how well these disturbances are rejected. Exceeding a gate driver's CMTI capabilities will result in incorrect operation. In minor cases, this may reduce converter efficiency, but in more serious instances, the incorrect switching can result in converter failure. As an example, here is a competitor's gate drive, which is showing the effects of exceeding its CMTI capabilities. This picture is an infinite persistent image of repeated gate transitions while a common mode transient is applied at different times. The gate driver input is in magenta, its output in cyan, and the applied transient in blue. Sometimes the gate driver is able to reject the transients and other times not. In comparison, here is the analog device's ADUM4120, which is a similar part in terms of propagation delay, but has only very minor timing jitter when exposed to the same common mode transient stress. Clearly, a more robust part. This shows that analog devices' high common mode transient immunity will provide better converter performance. Now that now that we have the gate drive doing what we want, when we want, and not responding to disturbances, we can start to add in additional system level features, such as protection from short circuits. Short circuit protection is especially important for inverter applications because as I mentioned earlier, when discussing the signal chain for the traction inverter, the switch node is connected directly to the motor windings or with minimal to no output impedance. This means that an external wiring or winding failure fault can result in large enough currents to damage the inverter and potentially result in a DC bus short of the high voltage battery. This system level failure can be mitigated by the gate driver detecting the overcurrent and safely turning off the switch before it is damaged. The basic concept for detecting excessive current is to monitor the drain voltage of a switch when it is on and if the drain voltage is too high due to the overcurrent, then turn off the switch. Analog devices gate drivers offer different features to allow this concept to be tuned for a particular application's specific needs. These include adjustable short circuit threshold detection voltages, adjustable timing for fault detection, a very fast comparator, and the ability to optimize turnoff once the fault is detected. When these features are properly applied, it is possible to protect the latest silicon carbide devices with a protection time under one microsecond. When a switch turns off, the DIDT of the turnoff interacts with the parasitic inductance of the DC bus loop to create a voltage which adds to the DC bus voltage to create a drain source voltage stress on the device turning off. Because the fault current increases the delta current being turned off, extending the turnoff time will reduce the VDS overshoot during the fault turnoff. This is achieved through a separate fault turnoff FET, which has a higher RDS on than the normal main turnoff FET. In order to obtain finer control of the fault turnoff, the ADUM4137 offers a separate shutdown pin to allow external adjustment of the turnoff resistance. In addition to protecting the switch, the gate driver can monitor the operating environment and take appropriate action. 
For example, the undervoltage lockout feature assures that the gate drive will not turn on the switch when it's unable to fully drive it on. The need for this feature is evident after examining a switch's family of output characteristics curves as illustrated for, by this 23 amp silicon carbide MOSFET. When the VGS is 15 volts, the switch will follow the leftmost curve and have a low drain source voltage for the operating current. If the supply voltage is reduced, then the gate source voltage will be lower, resulting in operation on one of the lower VGS curves and potentially even damaging the switch. The undervoltage lockout prevents this operational mode by assuring a sufficient gate supply. Analog devices gate drivers all include undervoltage lockouts and many parts even have methods to select the voltage by specifying the desired part grade when ordering. Some gate drivers <clears throat> include the feature to measure the external temperature of the switch by using either sensing diodes or an NTC thermistor mounted in or near the switch device. The voltage of the NTC or the or thermistor or the diodes is then converted to a PWM signal, which can be read by the controller directly as a digital stream or as a low pass or low pass filter to provide an analog voltage. The duty cycle can alternatively be obtained by reading a SPI register. Additional SPI registers allow the tuning of the measurement gain and offset for this, this, for this feature. In order to prevent overdriving an IGBT under cold conditions, the ADUM4138 has the ability to reduce the drive strength by lowering the output voltage when the IGBT is too cold for normal operation. Once the switch warms up sufficiently, the full drive strength and voltage is applied. In addition to the temperature management measurement, the SPI interface provides the ability to read the fault status information, as well as configuring the gate driver's tuning for trip voltages, selecting features, and are configuring the isolated supplies set point. All isolated gate drivers require an isolated supply, which means additional components, PCB area, and bomb cost. The ADUM4138 integrates a flyback controller with isolated voltage feedback to regulate this driver's supply voltage to the desired set point configured through its SPI interface. By integrating the controller and feedback loop, the required isolated supply is realized with just a handful of external components, saving valuable PCB space and reducing bomb cost. Finally, the gate driver can offer features that enable system level functions, such as functional safety. Functional safety makes sure that the system operates in a safe manner under all possible situations. For example, the 4137 offers the basic isolation and drive strength needed for operation in addition to temperature sensing to allow the functional safety controller to monitor the switch temperature, possibly through the SPI interface. In some automotive systems, there is a potential failure mode where the spinning motor's back EMF will exceed the DC bus voltage, potentially damaging the inverter and or the high voltage battery. Some functional safety concepts address this case by shorting the motor windings. The ASC pin allows the safety system to force the switch on independent of the state of the primary side. Other functional safety concepts depend on the gate drive to test for many different fault conditions in order to assure that the gate drive and power switch are functioning correctly. And now I'll hand over to Paul for a wrap up. Thank you, Eric, for a very interesting and informative overview. We've learned that with billions of isolation channels shipped, analog devices have excellent experience and credentials to deliver reliable, low noise isolation solutions with robust EMI, CMTI, and surge performance. 
we saw how the trending adoption of wide band gap switches provides considerable benefits in e-mobility space for meeting OEM system level needs, while also placing additional challenges on the gate drivers to meet drive strength, isolation rating, low latency, and the disturbance rejection requirements. Analog devices isolated gate drivers address these needs while also meeting narrow but critical switch protection timing windows needed for wide band gap switch technologies. We saw how integrating functions such as the flyback controller into the gate driver can help reduce size and cost, as can the integration of features needed to implement functional safety in e-mobility applications. Features such as over temp and over voltage detection, active short circuit, and feature-rich fault reporting, all of which is available in the family of analog devices gate drivers. These EV system needs can all be addressed within the broad portfolio of analog isolation and isolated gate driver offerings. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Paul, and thank you. Well, thank you very much to ADI for that presentation. I don't think there's any specific questions in the chat, unless anyone would like to ask one now. No, well, as I say, we, if you do think of any questions, please do contact me and I'll certainly get them addressed. So that's it for today. I'd like to thank all speakers for their interesting presentations. I think there was a really good mix between a high level market overview and then a more in-depth dive into the technology that's required. I think it's clear that the electrification of transport addresses climate change concerns and energy consumption, but also the growing desire to develop uh, smart solutions, including autonomous and intelligent vehicles. We have recorded the webinar today, so you're more than welcome to watch it again, or if you weren't able to join us live, you can catch up at it at a convenient time for yourselves. So after this, I will circulate the link to the live we webinar and also hopefully be able to circulate the slides from the today. Uh, our next webinar is following on from today's session. It's called Charging and Battery Management and it will take place two weeks today, so 10 o'clock on Tuesday the 30th of June. It is going to be the final webinar in this series, but we do hope that you can enjoy join us for that. Um, you can register now online for free. Um, all details are on our website, which is centercity.co.uk, or you can search by the Eventbrite platform. So many thanks again for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks' time for the final Arrow Comes Home webinar. Thank you. Thank you.